Hi, I'm uh, Ken Pekraski, one of the volunteers at the Mawa Museum, and I'm also the chair of the Les Paul Committee at the museum. Welcome to our continuing celebration of Les Paul. This is our final event, and we saved the best for last. Joining us tonight is Mr. Gene Paul, son of Les Paul. Gene is an audio recording mixing mi mastering engineer, producer, and musician. He was an engineer at the Atlantic Recording Studios during their famed 1960s to 1980s period, and is currently the chief mastering engineer at G&J Audio, a mixing and mastering studio for major and independent labels focused on reissues and new recordings. He has worked on thousands of projects and has engineered nine Grammy award-winning albums, with 29 total nominations in 15 different categories. He has engineered many hit recordings, including seven number ones on the Billboard and Pop Jazz charts, six more in the Pop Top 10, 10 more in the Jazz Top 10, and five in the R&B Top 20. I might add that Gene has put together a website that is a loving tribute to his father, Les Paul remembered, and you definitely need to check that out. Moderate, moderating tonight's event is uh, Charles Carreras, Professor Emeritus of History at Ramapo College and Vice President of the Mawa Museum. Simply put, without Charlie, there would be no Les Paul and Mawa exhibit. Charlie has been closely involved with the exhibit and its support program since its opening in 2001. I may be the chair of the Les Paul Committee, but Charlie is the dean. If you'd like to submit questions for Gene, you please use the Q&A section, which is on the bottom of your screen. And I will monitor and pass them along uh, to Gene. I'll try to get to as many as I can. So with that, I'd like to, to hand things over to Charlie. Charlie? Thanks, Gan. Uh, yes, welcome to everybody, and I'm excited to uh, have this conversation with Gene. I'm looking forward to it. We've had various conversations over the last weeks, and uh, he's a wealth of knowledge about Les and uh, recording and uh, all of his technologies and successes. I do want to emphasize what Ken just said. This, uh, this, this, this. Um, a Zoom um, program will go much better, I think, and it will have an added dimension. And I really encourage you to um, to let us know what you're thinking by asking questions. We encourage that, and Ken will uh, interrupt us uh, and 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 give us your thoughts as we're going along because uh, Gene knows a lot, and the the stories can go on for a long time. And we we have an hour. And uh, uh, we, we the hook out. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So uh, in addition, uh, this is not the last uh, program we're going to have with Gene. Uh, when we when we reopen the museum, which we hope to do shortly, maybe September, uh, we'll have Gene in the museum and in the live, and we'll have more programs like this. And in the meantime, we can have more virtual programs. So Gene's promised to continue working with us. So please uh, go to our website and keep keep in touch. Uh, so let's get right to the questions, Gene. Uh, you were born in 1944. You in, and uh, uh, so you can tell us a little bit about the famous garage. Uh, give us a short version of the garage in, in Hollywood and, and what went on in the mysterious garage. Well, the garage is interesting and that's a whole evening. But if you want the short version, dad's mother heard him on the radio and it wasn't him playing. <coughs> and she told him he was great on the radio. And he said, I wasn't on, Ma. <laughs> and, and that now turned dad where he started to say, something's wrong. My sound isn't unique enough. That's what the garage was about. How do I come up with a sound that is so unique, so different, that not only my mother knows, <laughs> but I can, I can do more. 
That's what the garage is about. How he put together the garage is a, a night unto itself. It is so simple. He never used an EQ. He never used a compressor. It was all natural, organic, mother nature, simplicity. That alone is magic. <laughs> because today, you couldn't get a console that had, didn't have an EQ on it. You couldn't get anything today that simple. So the simplicity of it was marvelous. He connected with Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby wanted to put a studio up for him. He didn't want to go into business. But yet his guys, when he got back home, said, well, if you don't do that, why not put something here in the garage where you can experiment? <clears throat> that experiment turned out to be one of the biggest moves for sound recording in the industry because he wanted, his view was sound should be as if it was the performer's view. So if you have a person singing, they hear themselves totally different than you hear them in a record. A guitar player, totally different. So he mic'd them, not a foot away, not eight, eight inches away. He mic'd them right up to the mouth. You got to pick the right mic, you got to pick the right atmosphere, and it's got to be a lot of things combined. But when you do that, that's what changed the industry on their viewpoint of miking. They called it close miking. Changed it completely. That garage is what implemented that thought. The Let garage. Go ahead. Let me interrupt you for one minute. And so a key part of that was the lathes that he recorded on before he had the tape deck. This was 1948. And we want to remind our audience that that very lathe is sitting in the Mauro Museum. And you can come visit it when we reopen, hopefully in September. So we're gonna, we're gonna get that plug in right here now. Well, not only is it there, but he built it. Yes, yes. And that was the lathe that started the multiple recordings. Yes. After about a year's time of him experimenting on anybody that came to the house that had anything to do with music, ended up, don't pass go, and you go directly to the garage. And he would be recording them, including Bing. Bing would come over to the house, and Ma would tell me I'd be running around the heads at the house playing with the kids, with, the, with uh, Bing's kids, and they would be in the garage recording. So the lathe ended up being the beginning of the multiples. Okay, Let's, let me ask you another question in a whole different area. When did you first realize your father's statue in the music world as a performer and, and musician? Uh, without a doubt, there were, were two things that made me realize who my dad was, because at, at home, I, it was nothing abnormal. You know, I thought everybody's dad had a studio. <laughs> you know, everybody's dad <laughs> built their own tape machine, built their own guitar, and that's the way I was brought up. There was nothing special until I played drums with him and ended up in Vegas. And I ended up seeing what the public saw. And when I saw that, and then I saw people come up for autographs, talk to dad, compliment him, enjoy the hell out of the show. Just, it was a different view. It wasn't me at home saying, yeah, dad, I'll do this. You want a mic, I'll do that, whatever. This was different. 
So that was the first time I figured out this guy is more than just uh, dead. <laughs> There's something more going on. The second part of it was when I got a job at Atlantic Records. And a person that worked there that was chief engineer and went on to be a very successful producer was Tom Dowd. He was, I ended up, he was my mentor at Atlantic. And at a certain point when I got my chops together, I sat with him and I asked him some questions because I knew that Atlantic got the second A track. Dad would talk about that. And so I asked him, I said, what, what is that about? Why did you get the eight track? And he said, well, I heard about Les experimenting and he had something at the house. So I went up and we talked. It took me five minutes after I got back to Atlantic to call Ampex up and order one. He put it in and it was the first major label to have the A track. And then at Atlantic, I heard musicians talk about that, talk about the guitar, talk about multi-track recording and what, how outstanding that was versus going to a smaller format or to stereo live. So, those were the two episodes that I really gained knowledge of who my dad was and what he was doing beyond steering me, you know. You I just, have a, uh, a question from somebody that kind of follows what you were just talking about a few minutes ago. Uh, this is a question from Joel. Uh, do you feel your dad was happier being an inventor or as an entertainer? With, with no thought, hesitation at all. He was driven to be an entertainer and a guitar player. Along the, the path of him doing that, he ran across things that he couldn't buy. If he could buy an electric guitar, he never would have built one. If he could buy a multi-track machine, he never would have built one, and so on and so forth. But the only thing he didn't need was the A track because he had an interview, and the interview was really interesting because I heard him say it at home. But when I built the website, it bothered me because I had to verify what I thought I heard. And, and I found a clip of him saying, in an interview, a guy asked him, okay, you've run with sound on sound, which was the mono tape machine with the fourth head, and he could overdub with it, clumsy as hell. Uh, and you, you now know what the eight track is. He says, give me your perspective. What do you think? And, and he looked at the guy, and said, listen, you know, I enjoyed Sound on Sound. And Sound on Sound, if for those who don't know what it was, it was a mono tape machine with a fourth head, which basically in, in, you know, stupid terms, when you recorded something on the tape and played it back, you heard it. Now, the next part you put on you now could press record and take the part you previously recorded and add the new part. Voila, that's great. Well, wait a minute, there's a catch. The catch was the previous part is gone. The two parts you just did are on there. But if you wanted to back up and say, well, let's take two, you can't. You had to start the song all over again. So one of the articles I have on the website in the uh, new sound section is the evolution of a hit record. And it's the story in Jackson Heights of how he made How High the Moon. 
And it is a remarkable story that concludes with him making the remark, you have to be stupid to do it the way I did it. <laughs> Look, let, me, let me stop you there. And Go ahead. remind our viewers once again, the Sound on Sound Machine is sitting in the exhibit area in the museum with the Wally board on top, and we even have the monitor now. So come by the museum and see it all. So you've got you've got his prize possessions in that museum. You've got his guitar. You've got the cutting lathe that he built. The sound on sound machine with the Wally Jones mixer, which was no EQ, just a, a pot. And he went right to the tape machine with it, as simple as can be. And you have the eight track the original first eight track. These are his prized possessions. And the board, and the board. Absolutely, the console goes with it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the wall, the wall, the wall. The wall was a secondary thing. That's but right, we have it. He, we he have went it. on with it, yeah. <laughs> but, but those pieces that you've got are, they changed the industry of music with a guitar and music with how you can record. Yes. And the two of them were, I think, some of the biggest influences of, on the industry uh, that there ever was, you know. So you, you mentioned about touring with your father. You were like 16 or 17 when you first started touring with him playing drums. And you did it for like 10 years. There must be a lot of stories about that. I know you, oh. you, you, you went to Japan even with him. Uh, can you tell us a few stories about that? Well, Japan, Japan was uh, odd because we got <laughs> there and, and no, no, it, 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 was, it ended up great. But the start of it was horrifying because we walk in and it's the first concert and we're we're rolling along and dad's going like mad mary's in there and every all the things are happening you know and uh what happened was is the audience didn't applaud and when they didn't applaud this threw him and he walked off stage at the end of the concert and walked up to the manager and talked to him about it. He said, we, we bombed. And the manager said, no, 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 no. It's not polite to applaud. <laughs> so that was that story. But the one I love was in Alaska. We were doing a USO tour with Mary and dad. <clears throat> Mary's got her gown on. I got my tux on, dad's got his tux on, and we're with a full orchestra, and we're playing on the concert for the military. And halfway through the show, Mary turns around and dad's gone. He's still playing, but he's gone. And Mary looks up in the band to me, and I look at her, and I see dad over on the side, and I kind of give a nod, and she looks over there, <laughs> And she starts to laugh. Dad is sitting at the table with some privates with a big mug of beer playing the show. <laughs> and, and that's why I say an entertainer guitar player is who he was. And, and really on the way to all this is where he just couldn't help himself because he, he knew he wanted to do something, and if it wasn't available, he'd have to pause and see if he could create it or find the person that could help him do it. But he needed a specific tool, you know, whether it be the delayed echo, uh, regular room echo, that's a, a, another great story with how Echo came about. Uh, 
but that, add, that's, I, that's who he was, you know. Yeah. Go ahead. I have a question from Hal talking about Echo. Uh, can you talk about Les's designing the, uh, the capital Echo Chambers? I don't know a heck of a lot about the uh, Echo Chambers out there. However, he did make one in his home in New Jersey. And it was incredible. I mean, it was so incredible that one night we're both sitting there doing a mix and we hear a cricket. And <laughs> <laughs> there's a cricket in the echo chamber. Now, I dare you to go find him. <laughs> and he stayed there for like a week. And we left the door open. We put M&Ms down. We did everything to try and get rid of this guy. But an, a, a cricket in an echo chamber is not a good thing. Yeah, but but wasn't, he, wasn't the echo chamber carved into this side of the railroad the mountain? The side of the mountain, yeah. <laughs> that was a big deal. I mean, that took a lot of determination to do that. Yeah, he was that way. When he focused on something, <laughs> it was over with. Yeah. You know, and he did the same thing out in, in, uh, for Capitol, but then he took that a step further, and when he got in, in, in Jersey, he wanted to make one without restrictions. Well, you got to use it this size, whatever. He threw that out the window, and he made his own, and it was absolutely, he sat with me one day, and I said, what's with the echo? And he said, the greatest echo I ever heard was in a silo in Germany. And I said, what? And he said, yeah. He says, if you listen to <clears throat> the Philharmonic part of what Germany did with strings and all that stuff, he said it was immaculate how they did it. They took a silo and they put a speaker at the bottom of the silo pointing up and they took a microphone and put it on a rope on the top of the silo and when they wanted to change the distance in echo they'd lower it so they get a crank and they'd lower it and he said the echo for that was so natural so he was a freak on echo but it, it's so funny because Echo started in, in uh, Jackson Heights when they were making, and it's in the article with How I the Moon. Mary was singing, and because they were using sound on sound, they realized that if there's a mistake, they got to start all over again. So there are planes going over and traffic outside. So dad came up with the brilliant idea of putting three or four blankets over Mary's head. And she's singing with a 44, which is a big mic. And she's trying to sing with some feeling under blankets. And then when he finally got it where he liked it before he recorded, he said, this is great. I don't hear the planes anymore. Everything's perfect, except for the fact you sound like you're under blankets. So he put a microphone in the hallway and a speaker in, in the bathroom and it created an echo. And that's where he fed it out there because he didn't get the natural sound of the room. That's how echo started for him. That's great, that's great. So. Uh... 1964, Mary moves back to California and they get divorced. And uh, he, he, he says in a lot of interviews that he's depressed and he's not gonna play anymore in public. And uh, so he's gonna be an agent. And I saw a notice in the Bergen record as a, as a, as a, a newspaper article in the record, like in 68, that uh, is a comment on what Les is doing and it says he's an agent. And it says at the end, if you want to contact me, if you're an up and coming musician, you can write to me in Mahua, New Jersey. So, so then, so he's not playing very much regularly. But then in 1972, his good friend, Bucky Pizzarelli 
calls them. You want to tell us that story? Well, uh, yeah, his, his retirement had a little more to do with that. It had to do a lot with the arthritis because he had his pinky on his fingering hand uh, operated on and frozen in a position in which he could still use it. And it, it subsided the uh, arthritis. So arthritis became a problem for him. And between that and the divorce, and it's not the same, <laughs> he ended up getting to the point where he thought it was time for him to move on and, and so on and so forth. That went down for a while, and I was there then, and it was interesting because he almost had a feeling that this was the whole story. <laughs> and, and every once in a while, Lou would be playing in some bar someplace, or Bucky Pizzarelli be playing someplace, and those were the two instigators, without a doubt, you know. Uh, and, and they would get him to come out. And he'd go there and he would jam all night. And I'd be sitting there watching him and he had a, a spark in his eye. He dug it. And, and he was doing good. It wasn't as great as, as what he did before, but he was doing real good. And he was still bit by that. But when he had the surgery, it stopped him again for his heart. But his 19, shock 19, came 19, up. 1980, uh, he was in Cleveland in 1980, right? Yep, yep. He had the heart surgery and, and coming out of that was very successful. But the doc said to him, listen, you, you got to make me a promise. You, you got to stay busy. And <laughs> he's always been busy. But he thought about it, and I think between the doctor and Lou Paolo and Bucky Pizzarelli, it rang a bell with him. And he wanted to get back into it, but he wanted to do it quietly because he was afraid that he couldn't play as good, and he was always concerned about the audience and their feelings, and he didn't want to let them down and all that. So. He came back and he ended up at Fat Tuesdays. And Fat Tuesdays is where he started to realize that he could play. And that there was a relationship between what he was doing and what the audience was expecting. So it grew. And as it grew and his arthritis bothered him, he would do what he does greatly, and that is tell stories. So it, none of it bothered him, and the audience loved it. So it ended up being a successful thing, and it's funny because he, I found a video with him talking about it, and he said, bottom line, after I got the piece of paper and put the plus and the minuses down, he said, I really was meant to play the guitar and entertain. And that's why being a little bit on the inside, I know how much the guitar and entertaining meant to dad. And, and the inventing was really because he couldn't get it. He couldn't buy it. And he had the chops and he had the focus. Yeah, I mean, if there was a guy with focus, I never was the cup half full. It was always like positive. Everything was positive with him. Okay. And if he couldn't figure it out, he'd find a guy that could help him. If I can so, interject a, uh, a question from Scott. It's rather long, but I think I could cut it down and paraphrase. Gene, uh, not only did Les give us collectively all his uh, technology and creations, but he personally had face to face with numerous individuals acting like a, like a mentor uh, that created true guitar loving people. Can you you know comment on your father's uh, relationship and mentoring up and coming uh, guitar players? 
Uh, specifically, I don't know that as much, uh, but I knew, I, I, let's put it this way. I wasn't disappointed when I heard that he was going to, and this is after he passed, he was going to, he wanted a foundation put together. Uh, I, I kind of smiled with it because I knew how much it meant to him because how he was brought up and how his mother had so much faith in him and how many of the players in the beginning stuck with him and, and, and groomed him and helped him. And he appreciated that. And I think that's why he put the foundation together. And the foundation is really, and, and I've been up to the Mawa school up there, the college up there, and, and the foundation put in a studio up there with equipment. And I've heard of other places with it. And I got to say, it's absolutely phenomenal because you're given a chance for the next generation to whet their appetite. And he had no problems in wanting that for the next generation to have. Specifically, some of the people that he, he groomed or got attached to, um, I was busy at Atlantic and, and I really wasn't privy to some of those. But I do know the final outcome with the foundation and it's a wonderful organization. It's really about helping the kids and giving them a shot. And dad used to say, if it ain't on your plate, you don't know about it. And that's really what he was about. You know, looking, looking back, uh, he didn't mind saying that I was given some real good breaks and I want to do the same thing for, for kids. So that's, that's what he was about with that one. Mm. You know. One of the things that, uh, if you look at your, your father's whole career, uh, one of the things that impressed me, and I want your reaction here, he was born in 1915, and he, got a, he made his own crystal radio set like in 1927, <laughs> 28. And he said, you know, he could listen to music and he was so fascinated. He could listen to music from everywhere. So, and, and, and. Little now, did he know he'd have an illegal radio station. That's right, that's <laughs> right. So, but uh, like uh, Gene Autry would be playing nearby and, and, and other musicians, uh, Joe Walton, and, and he would go to these and he would study them and he would watch what they were doing on the guitar and, and he really seemed to absorb how they were performing, how they were acting as an entertainer. And then he goes to Chicago and he's so many different uh, entertainers there. And one of, the, one of the writers said that he grew up in vaudeville and he was aware of vaudeville and the whole, the whole idea behind vaudeville of of being there for the audience you're not like just a musician you're performing but you you're really engaged in the audience uh, and that 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 was his thing and he said one time you give the audience what they want and uh and 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 you take care of them and you and you you see what you read the audience in his small club of 200 in the city and you can you can connect with them. Whereas you, if you're in an arena of twenty thousand people, you can't connect. Absolutely, yeah. And it's funny in in Chicago, he was a DJ, playing country and western music, and and bluegrass stuff and that. He was all over that, making a lot of money. And uh, then he figured out jazz. You know, uh, Lester Young was in town, Tatum was in town, and he got bit by that. And he left the radio station, which he was making a good amount of money. Uh, and he, then he made peanuts playing jazz. 
but he felt as though jazz was the opening up. It was a development, a piece of the development of him that he had to have. And he even for a period of time did that. He was popping bubbles for strippers and he was involved with, with even Jackie Gleason. He played piano for Jackie Gleason while Jackie Gleason was starting his career. And then ended up where Tatum came to town and he gave up the piano immediately. Uh, and then went on their way to Chicago or to uh, New York. And that's where he ended up with uh, Paul Whiteman. And again, Paul Whiteman was the same thing. He soaked up everything. One, one time with Paul Whiteman, he was, uh, he got a chance to perform and his performance, Paul asked him, well, what, what, what do you want to do? You want to come out from the side of the stage? You want to come out from the band? What do you, what, tell me what you want to do. And dad said, well, I'll come out from the side of the stage. And Paul said, fine. And that's what he did. And he bombed. And he went backstage after the show. And he was knocking on the door and he said, and, and Paul said, come in, Les. And, and he walked in and he said, how do you know it was me? Oh, I knew it was you. And he said, well, what's the question? What, what, what's on your mind? And dad said, what happened? And he says, you really want to know? And, and yeah, yeah. And Paul said, you came from the side of the stage. If you want to come out of the band, you'd get a different response. So the next night, they came out of the band and they were a complete success. So everything dad did, he would soak up and learn. That's why he was so dedicated when you watch, if you had a chance to see him at Fat Tuesdays or the Iridium, you know, that he used to say to me, always watch the feet. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> what? What are you saying? He says, if the feet are tapping, you got them. You're communicating with them. He always attached everything he did, even to the point where, and he never said it, but this is my thought. When he did the jazz at the Philharmonic with Nat, it was very interesting to me because when I, when I first heard it, which he never played at home, none of his jazz stuff, early jazz playing, did he ever play at home. I never even knew he did it until I got older and I had to master one of his records. <laughs> and I mastered it and called him up and I said, you, why didn't you ever play any of this? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that that's what it was with that. You know, uh, it, it was just it was so interesting to uh, to go through this whole revolution with him, uh, and and every step is like, especially building the the website, because now I go back and I'm hearing the things and I'm realizing what he did and what I missed, and it, it all fits together. And the jazz and the Philharmonic was interesting because what he did there was when, when they were performing, all of these great musicians, they were all playing above the audience's head. And, and dad <laughs> invariably wanted to have them join in. So when he did the chase with Nat, that's what it was about. It was about when have you been at a jazz concert where the audience was laughing? And in that case, if you listen carefully, the audience is having a ball. And when he did the chase, that opened the whole world up for the audience. And that's why I continue to say that dad really was a guitar player and an entertainer. He couldn't help himself, you know. 
another dimension that I found very intriguing was when he played in Midtown with the, with the big bands in the 30s, I guess he arrived in New York around 37, 37, 38, 39. When, when he finished with the big band, he'd take the subway up to Harlem and oh, play, yeah. play during the night. Uh, and this was unusual. White musicians didn't do that in the late 30s. Uh, no. But uh, he was playing with all the greats in Harlem. Absolutely. One, one night he was, he told me, it's funny, he told me these stories so many times. And as a young kid, you kind of listen to him and you say, oh, that's nice. And then when you figure out who do, he was talking about. And later on in life, I realized who he was talking about. And he said, one night I was up there jamming with Tatum. And of course, when I figured out who Tatum was, the story <laughs> became more important, you know. <laughs> and he's sitting in the club, in the back of the club, having a beer with Tatum. And the guys are up there jamming. And Tatum leans over to Dad and he says, listen, I got a question for you. He says, uh, are there two keys stuck on the piano? Now, Tatum's blind in the back of a club. And he's listening to this guy play and he's telling you, not only that there are two keys stuck, but he told dad what the two keys were. <laughs> and, he, and he says, he says, can you confirm that for me before we go up? And dad said, sure, with, with a smile, you know. And he confirmed it. It was exactly the two keys that Tatum said. So when they went up and jammed, dad positioned himself where he could watch them. And he would, he would do the run, and with his uh, one hand he'd do the run, the other hand he'd flick the notes back up. So he could continue the run and have the notes available. <laughs> and that's why he played the whole night. And it was just a wonderful story of the level of these guys. You know, another story with it was, they were jamming. Lester Young was there, and and Tatum, and all the guys, and and a horn player walked in the door, and sat down at a table and had a beer. And uh, halfway through the set, they said, "Come on up." So he opened up his case, grabbed his horn, went up on stage, and he's playing along. And finally, it was his turn for a solo. So he took the solo. And he was kind of stumbling. And halfway through the solo, he kind of was stumbling enough where he stopped. And he walked off the bandstand while everybody was playing, didn't finish his solo, packed up his horn, had the rest of his beer, and they were done with the tune by then. And the guy looked up at the guys and said, I'm going home to practice. I'll see you tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> and can you imagine sitting and playing with this caliber of musicians? And dad didn't hesitate for a moment. He lived up there. When they finished the show with Warren, he was up there immediately, all night long. And, and that was his college. And it's funny because when you listen to the trio work he did, the trio work was the beginning of the multiples. When you listen to what the trio did, and I've got it on the website, the trio recording, jazz recording of How High the Moon and Lesson Mary's How High the Moon. And when you listen to the two, you can see where it evolved. I, I, I did that today, Gene. It's really, really interesting to, to listen to them side by side. It's very interesting. Yeah. Ken, you have any new questions? Yeah, I have a few, so I wanted to... Uh, yes. Uh, it's building up here. Uh, let's see, let me go to... Um, this is from Steve. Uh, wasn't it Tom Dowd who invented the linear fader? 
Les had rotary, rotary pots like the Rain Nama console at the museum? Yeah, he he did uh, he did uh, create that. Tom Tom was uh, way way he was like that, you know. He was a he was a musician. He could play piano and and knew arranging. Uh, he knew engineering. He knew producing. He was a, a a wild guy to be around. And he not only made the faders you're talking about but they were upside down. In other words, off was up because he felt as though naturally the palm of your hand rested and, and your fingers were off it was natural. <laughs> so he built many a consoles with uh, NCI down in Florida. Uh, he, he was, he's a special guy. Uh, <coughs> You know, dad, dad was attached to him. And when he told me that, he said, a guy called me up and, and he wanted to know if I knew anybody to be an apprentice to get into Atlantic and, and, and engineer. And he said, would you, what do you think? Would you like to do something like that? And I said, well, who, who are we talking about? And I said, Tom Dowd. And I said, well, who's Tom Dowd? Well, I had no idea, you know. Uh, so he said to me, he says, go out in the, in the other room and get the record, The Genius of Ray Charles. Now, Dad used to play that record all the time and just love what was done on it. So I get the record and I bring it out and Dad says, turn the record over. So I turn the record over. He says, you see a guy's name by the name of Tom Dowd on it? I said, you gotta be kidding. No. He said, this guy is asking the question. Now, when I ask you again, what's your answer? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, where is this? He says, New York City. Well, I don't know my butt from a hole in the ground in New York. Uh, I, he said, calm down. He said, I'll tell you where to go. And you go in there. And okay, so I went in and I got a tie on, I did everything proper and I was green as hell. And I walked in there and I went into the main studio and nobody's there and it looked like a barn. It was painted green and orange, just hideous color, colors, terrible. The console had no EQ on it, no nothing, nothing like my dad's console. And I'm standing there wondering, what is this about, you know? So I got to the phone and I called my dad up. And I said, Dad, I said, am I, I, I'm, am I in the right place? And he says, yeah, you're in the right place. He says, uh, why? I said, well, I'm in a room that, that just looks so primitive. And I said, I don't get it. And he said, well, describe the room. I said, well, orange and green. And he said, no, 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 you're in the right room. He said, you know the genius of Ray Charles? He said, it was cut in that room. He said, now close your eyes and visualize Ray Charles and the orchestra in that room. That's where it was done. He says, now, what you should do now is just shut up and learn. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my beginning to Tom Dow and Atlantic Records and that whole universe that I was fortunate enough to be involved with. Uh, but that that's who dad was, you know. Mm -hmm. he, he gave, you know, you mentioned him giving to guitar players and stuff. Uh, he did the same thing. I saw that with me, you know, and that's part of what motivated me. Uh, after a while, I was pissed that he died. There were so many things I wanted to say to the guy. And uh, it, it finally just got to the point where I owed him. I really owed him. And, and that that website is my back to him.
It's yeah. a great. It's a great tribute, Gene. It's a great tribute. Yes. It's a well, I'm glad, beautiful, I'm glad beautiful you're job. Thank you. And and, and, and you're going to come to Mawa and continue that yes. right in Mawa with with the people that visit the museum. We're looking forward to it, Gene. Absolutely, love it. I, I have a, a question from Frank. His nephew wants to become a recording engineer. He's taking classes in the field at a community college. Any advice for him on how to enter the field? Well, that's a good question. I was asked that once before. Um, yeah, it's, it's rather abnormal. But if you think to yourself that I started out at Atlantic recording 30 pieces live to two track. And that was a tough job. But it was all live. And everybody listened and said, that's it, let's play it down. And when they got to the next tune, ah, we're not ready with that tune. They moved on to the next one. It was a totally different approach on how to record. Today, you can have 100 plus tracks. And some of the tracks, no two people were in the same room at the same time. How do you take 100 tracks and make it sound like they were all there at one time? And the blend was complimentary because they were all there at one time and they all adjusted. So how do you take a hundred tracks and put them together? So my question is this, if you don't know music, how do you know what they're supposed to sound like in a mix? So my, my answer to that question is, and I had a, a, a fella come in and ask me that question. And he, he came in and, and it, I was mastering his album, a headbanger, rock and roll, heavy hair down to his ankles. So I didn't expect any clever conversation here, but he sat there and he came up to me at the end of the session and he said, listen, I would like to do what you do. How do I do it? What do you recommend? And I said, well, come back later and we'll talk before the end of the session. So he came back and I was in one of those moods where I said to him, I said, get a ticket and go to Lincoln Center and hear a symphony. Now, this is a headbanger, right? So I thought immediately I get the finger and he'd walk out of the room. He thanked me. Never saw him again. And nine, ten months later, he comes walking in the room with another album to do. And I forgot the guy. And he walked in the room and he holds his hand up like this. And I said, hi, you know. He says, you don't remember me, do you? I said, honestly, no. He says, I'm the guy you sent to Lincoln Center. <laughs> I said, oh, really? <laughs> I said, did you go? He says, I went five times. Said, I never heard anything like that in my life. He touched my soul so heavy that I had to grab him and hug him. To have somebody who is basically never heard anything like that in his life, the only thought that came back to my mind was, Dad used to say, if it ain't on your plate, you don't know about it. And this guy came back in and said he was absolutely with goosebumps going up his arms, hearing that music. So anybody who wants to do mixing, recording, any of that stuff, you gotta know music. But you gotta know music from the player's viewpoint. Dad once had a conversation with Benny Goodman. And at the height of Dad's career, 
Dad and Mary went backstage to see Benny Goodman. And Benny Goodman sat there and said, Les, I don't know what you're doing, but you're successful as all get out, and I wouldn't be caught dead doing what you're doing. And Dad was thrown back by that. And he says, what do you mean? He says, I want the least amount of engineering in my records. He says, if I could have no engineers, I'd be happy. He says, I want the fewest amount of mics on my orchestra because the engineers the mixing people are the musicians. They balance the record. Case in point, listen to any record that uh, any of the big bands did. You know, Count Basie, great example. They were immaculate. You could take a mono record today, listen to it, and tell each player that was playing. There was magic to the simplicity of the creative part was the musician. And dad told me that story so many times. And that's what he did in the garage. He would allow, and I said, dad, when you have four mics and you're recording seven, eight people in the garage, I said, and the bass player's short, what do you do? He says, he takes one step closer to the mic. It was all about leakage and natural, organic sound. That is something that's missing from the recordings today. And when you go and hear a symphony, you'll understand why Mother Nature is still there. But boy, you got to be aware of it. And I'm thinking that uh, we're, I guess we're approaching the hour. And, and uh, Gene and I had talked about a question that he was looking forward to, uh, to answering for our audience. <laughs> but we could remind people that we can go past the hour. Some people might be leaving, but we can take questions after Gene uh, has this final comment, and that is, I asked Gene to think about what is Les's most enduring legacy? That's a tough one. I've heard more people talk about that topic, and that's not my view. My view is that he was uh, an amazing guitar player, and an entertainer obsessed with making his people, his audience happy. And I think along the way, he changed the way we look at the guitar and he changed the way we record music today. And to me, that's his legacy. That's, that's beautiful. That's, that's great. That's really great. Can we take a few more questions from our viewers? Um, uh, this one is from Muriel. Um, do you have any thoughts or memories about when Chet Atkins and Les recorded together? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I saw him a couple <laughs> times at the club. <laughs> Dad, Dad loved Chet and vice versa. And they got along so well. Uh, you talk about two guys on two separate ends of the pole. And yet, Dad looked forward to blending in. He would do that so much. And it was almost like he, he liked the challenge. He really admired the challenge to fit in to Chet's world is what he did. Because if he stayed in his world, it would be mud and water, you know, it wouldn't mix at all. Uh, 
So he, he would go that route with it. But I know he admired the hell out of Chet. Um, and they had a real good time making the record. And he enjoyed going on tour for a couple spots and down at the club he'd be there. And it was just a great, it was something he wanted to do. And finally got the shot and the time he was right. And uh, you can't look at the success. I mean, <laughs> it was a big success. Mm -hmm. And it was, again, one of those things that you'd say, oh, okay, you know. But then when you heard it, you heard the love. You heard the passing with what was going on and the trading off. Um, and, and they both enjoyed the hell out of it, you know. Uh, another question, this is from, I, I believe it's Gleb. Uh, he asks, what's the, se what's the secret of a fantastic sound balance that was in all the records, even simple boards? And as an example, recording How High the Moon in the Bathroom, that's the perfect harmony in its essence. Was it magic of less or was there any hints and techniques? Well, there was always a hint in techniques because uh, the cutting lathe was nothing but obstacles. I mean, you can't think of a more crude way to work with a cutting lathe and, and back and forth. With sound on sound, it had its problems. Uh, for instance, if you put a bass on first, uh, by the time you got done with the record, it would change because of constantly recording over and over and over the response curve would shift some of the elements. So what he would put the bass and the lead guitar and the lead vocal on last. So it's a total reverse of what you think of putting a record down. <laughs> but to him, it was normal. So his way of recording it didn't have too many handicaps because in the, in the sense that he was the engineer, he mixed it live and played it live. And, and when he played it live is where he mixed it. So he would change balances on his guitar with how he played it. That's why his recording sounded so unique. And, and if you read the article on the evolution of a hit record, he speaks about knowing the record before he punched the record button, before he started. He knew the intro, he knew the exit, he knew the chorus, he knew the verse. He basically knew what he wanted Mary to do and he knew the parts. Now, was there ad libs in there? Absolutely. But he was from the world of one take. So for him to do one take a million times, and there were 25 or 28 parts to How High the Moon. So it, 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 it's, it's a spectacular view of really an abby normal way to record. But because it was him, and, and, and because, listen, if, if, if Pro Tools would have been available back then, he would have made that work. The tool was not, the tool was not the problem. The problem was, get me to something so I can lay my idea down that I've got now. That was the whole goal. That was his goal with, I don't want to sit with an acoustic guitar. I don't want to be in the back of the band. I want to be in front. That led to the electric guitar. I don't want a common ordinary sound. I want something different. That's what led to the multiples. All the handicaps he had to put up with, he states in the article, you got to be impossibly insane to do what I did. And then when he was asked, oh, you know, sound on sound, you know, the A track, what, what's your thoughts? Well, he said, I had more fun with the sound on sound. That's how much it was in his mind 
that I have an idea, I got to place it someplace. And whether it be the cutting lathe or it be sound on sound, he never made one hit record on the eight track. It was all made on the horrifying <laughs> cutting <laughs> lathe and he made 21 records oh. on the cutting lathe that he took the capital and, and they just went with it. And it was a big success, you know. Uh, so it was him. He had an urge, the urge, whether it be the guitar, whether it be the sound on the recordings, it was him with an idea and he had to capture that quickly. And that's what he did. I have another question from Steve. Um, and I guess Steve was at uh, the house. Uh, we were sitting, and forgive me for reading this, uh, but I think it's all relevant. Uh, we were sitting behind the API console. I asked Les who played bass. I asked, I asked him who played bass on the Les and Mary hits. He said, I did. I asked with what instrument he said his guitar. He then went on to talk about how that gave him more space. As opposed to using a bass gene, um, please tell folks the details behind that space saving decision. Well, he did that all the way back to the original multiples. I think one record he used a bass player and that was for a moment. And then he realized that particular thing and he found out that Playing the bass gave him more of a structure on what he wanted to do with the other parts. So in, rather than interpret it through somebody else, he played it. Even to the point where I asked him one day, I said, Dad, I said, you don't use a compressor. You, you don't use these tools that normally we use when we record. I said, I watched you play the bass on this particular tune. He was doing something on the A track. And I said, what are you looking over at the VU for? And he says, that's how I'm leveling it. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, I watched the VU and when the note goes soft, I know I got to play it a little harder. <laughs> so that's how he did he knew enough about recording and he knew enough about the process to adapt these sly little things that he did because he hated compressors. He hated limiters. He did not want, he wanted natural expression. And that's how he did it. And I watched him and I said, that was interesting. And, and of course, that was when I was a kid. And when I got to Atlantic, I figured out yeah, he was right. The minute you start putting vocalists that don't know how to use a mic are horrifying because you got to put a compressor, you got to put something in there to control them. So one of my first gigs was uh, Aretha. And I went to Tommy and I said, how do you record Aretha? This is like Pavarotti, you know. <laughs> I mean, I put her in front of the window, and when you saw her chest blow up, you knew a note was going to come that was going to knock the chandeliers down. And he said, here's how you do it. You go to a fader first, then you go to the limiter or compressor. But the fader first, and you ride the fader. And that's how I dealt with her. But again, that backs up. And Tommy was the same vintage as dad. You know, he believed in nothing in the line. He believed in, in natural. And that was part of his gift too, you know. Mm -hmm. okay, I think we'll end on this question. Um, you know, what's your thoughts about modern technologies and music? Uh, the, the question is, he's personally working with creative or artificial intelligence. So that's definitely what I would like to ask about. Are you accepting that revolution in, in human computer creativity collaboration? Or are, you, or are you against composing computers and all that goes with it? Uh, 
he got stopped with the eight track. The eight track allowed him to stop. So he's from the old school. You know, the, the, the real question today is, can you carry the old school forward and not lose the gems of knowing the song well enough that you're ready to record? I've done recordings where a guy didn't know the title of the tune for six months. He had no idea what he was recording. So if you can carry some of the gems forward, I, I don't think it makes any difference what platform you're on, as long as it sounds good and it carries the sound that you want. How you use it is the question. <clears throat> You know, uh, there, there, there may be three or four engineers that I can honestly say still carry forward the natural organic way to record. And the rest of them are shooting from the hips. And that's why so many recordings today sound so cold, artificial, perfect, you know, uh, and, and, and don't have that organic, human, natural sound to it. You know, I mean, go hear a symphony. And the minute you hear a symphony, you're knocked down by the fact that this is mother nature. And the minute you put a PA guy in the way, you got another interpretation of it. I've gone to clubs and heard people that have a PA in there and you cannot hear what they're doing on stage. It's so changed, you know? So there is a lot of things from the past that should be carried forward and not lost. And it's funny because I talked to dad about that way before he passed and, and he was so busy doing other things, he didn't want to get involved in it. But I, I wanted him to do some courses, some lectures on recording and technique and that kind of thing. And uh, he just wouldn't go there, you know. Uh, but that's, I, I don't, like I said, if Pro Tools was there when he started with the multiples, he would have used Pro Tools. So maybe we'll make a transition, Ken, and, and remind uh, our audience that, uh, again, uh, another session that goes right into the technology Gene, and focus on the technology and the recording and the sound and the production of sound and uh, and uh, really get down to the nuts and bolts. That would be very exciting. Love it. Great. Uh, well, first of all, I want to uh, express our thanks to uh, Gene and Charlie. Uh, I think calling this a fantastic, fascinating uh, conversation this night, I think is an understatement. Uh, it was really, really good, really, really interesting. Lots of nice uh, questions from our viewers. Um, so this uh, concludes the museum celebration of the Les Paul 105th birthday. Happy birthday, Les. Oh. Um, but the party does continue. Uh, New York-based rock band Nash will be streaming live tonight at nine o'clock, uh, not only to celebrate Les's birthday, uh, but to bring awareness and support to Guitar for Vets, an organization that provides hope to thousands of vets with post-traumatic stress disorder through the healing power of, of music. So please turn into their Facebook page or the Guitar for Vets Facebook page. And when you look, if you're looking for Nash, it has to be N dot A dot S dot H dot. Because if you just put in Nash, there's going to be a hundred Nashes that come up. Um, <laughs> and our thanks uh, over, this was a fantastic uh, few days. So our thanks to our participating artists for the, uh, for the celebration, our good friend Lou Paolo, uh, Gary Masarapi, uh, Vinny Reniolo, Muriel Anderson, and Tom Bresch. And of course, uh, our tonight's guest, Gene Paul like to thank uh, our support team behind the scenes, and that would be Adam Nemeth, our technical director, 
who really sort of guided us through these last few days. This is all like kind of a new world for the museum, for us in the museum. So he was really, really good in terms of uh, uh, his uh, involvement in this project. And you could check out his uh, his website. Uh, Amp he's from Ampfx, A M P F X dot N E T. Uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Diane Matteo. He, she's a board member at the museum, and also she's our web administrator. Uh, she really kind of put together like a real comprehensive package, so we, people could go to that website and see everything that was going on. The links worked. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Diane. And that if you missed any of the uh, performances over the weekend, um, uh, you can access them through that website and you know see them again, uh, or see them if you haven't seen them. Um, and also, this session is also being recorded. So um, I would think in a few days we'll have this available online. I uh, also would like to thank uh, Danny Zanoni. Uh, she was our social media coordinator. Uh, you probably would have noticed that uh, over the past week, she was um, posting uh, quotes from uh, various types of celebrities who were influenced by Les, and also a picture of them or a picture of them with Les. She also kind of like help with the promotion of all these events, you know, getting the word out, and it was very effective. So she did a terrific job. Uh, of course, uh, we thank uh, Michael Brownstein and Sue Baker from the Les Paul Foundation, uh, because without them, we can't do this. Uh, so, you know, we're very appreciative of their support. Uh, before, before you log out, because I can see the numbers going down, um, I just want to remind people that this is a, a fundraiser. So we have donation buttons uh, placed uh, not only on the Les Paul and Marwa Facebook page, uh, but also the Marwa Museum Facebook page, as well as the home page of the Marwa Museum. And uh, any minimum donation, $5, uh, any, any uh, donation you'd like to make, it would, we, we totally would appreciate it. And uh, it goes to directly toward the, uh, the exhibits and it goes to um, uh, the programs like this one. Uh, it's, 100, it's staff 100% volunteer. So people like uh, Charlie and I don't get paid for what we do. We may, you know, get a Hershey nugget, um, but, um, but all the money and it's all tax deductible. So we would really appreciate if you would consider uh, making a donation. The museum is currently closed and if everything goes well and it's starting to look a little bit better for New Jersey, uh, we'll reopen in September. Um, and we're taking the necessary steps to ensure a safe environment in the building. So check out our website and social media uh, for updates. And uh, when the museum opens, we'll see you there. And uh, until then, have a fun, safe summer have a good evening and stay well.